we are going to follow the money. Everything you need to know can be understood with this simple phrase, follow the money. And believe me, that's what's happened. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. Here comes the money. Welcome to College Sports Follow the Money, an all-new podcast diving into the critical issues surrounding the big, big business of college sports. I'm Andrew Monaco, joined by former president of Texas A&M University and former chancellor at the University of Missouri, Dr. R. Bowen Lofton, and former vice president and general manager of Fox Sports Southwest, John Heike. From NIL to the transfer portal and opt-outs to the college football playoff, conference realignment, and more, we tackle the key issues facing college athletics today and into the future. I need to feel you, Jerry. Show me the money. Jerry, you better yell. Show me the money. Show me the money. We welcome you to episode number 65, College Sports Follow the Money. We are inside the Pitbull Studios. I'm going to keep doing that until he <laughs> signs on with us. <laughs> Along with Dr. R. Bowen Lofton and John Heike. I'm Andrew Monaco. So glad that you are with us. I'm going to put this out there. Howdy, fellas. Hope you had Howdy. a great weekend. Howdy. Pretty spectacular weekend. I know it wasn't the result we wanted. But there's nothing like a college football Saturday nor a Saturday night. Kyle Field, and on the campus of Texas A&M University. I've experienced a number of them. You guys have experienced a lot more. Something special. I've always said, bucket list for a college football fan. I thought Saturday proved that. Oh, yeah. And anybody I talked to at the game uh, who wasn't one of the Aggie faithful who've been there many times was extraordinarily blown away and complimentary. They were complimentary for all the hospitality. They were blown away by 107,000 plus and what kind of noise they can make <laughs> and what kind of passion they can express. <laughs> yeah, I had several Notre Dame fans in town, too. And the good word I kept hearing was just, wow. You know, they hadn't seen like game day was there. The whole, you know, you, you couldn't script a better way to, to do it with all of the activities and just the activation in Aggie Park. I mean, it looks spectacular. Yeah, I've got to give the nod to Wayne Roberts, Aggie Park. Uh, through his late wife Shannon, just just an outstanding backdrop, not just for all hundred for all three hundred sixty five days. It's a great place on campus, but what a backdrop yeah. for things like college game day. I, it just just phenomenal to have that. You love to see those kind of improvements, don't you? Absolutely, absolutely. It was also Mike Elko's first game as head coach of the Fighting Texas Aggies. Doctor Lofton, you wanted to get into the Coach Elko contract. Well, I, I did. I just thought it might be interesting to review. I think the, the terms have been known for a while, but uh, his contract uh, is really interestingly structured around incentivation. So that's where I, I think the, the story is right here. Uh, beginning at the $50,000 bonus level uh, for things such as uh, multi-year academic progress rate, rate of 960, which is, which is a good rate. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a really extraordinarily useful thing to challenge your, your players with to really not only play good ball, but also make good grades here at Texas A&M, uh, coach of the year for the SEC, 50 K national coach of the year, hundred K, uh, appearing in the SEC championship game, hundred K. And then the real money kicks in, uh, make the CFP, make the 12 team playoff. That's a cool million dollars, guys. Uh, make it to the quarterfinals uh, or win the SEC championship. Either one is $1.5 million. Uh, advance the CFP semifinals, $2 million. Uh, play in the championship game, $2.5 million. Win that game, $3.5 million. Now, I'd point out these are, these are not stackable. So whatever the highest one is is what he'd walk away with not the ones that may build up to that uh, in, in, in a series, basically. But still, $3.5 million for winning the national championship is, is serious change. And that's a reason to play hard and coach hard, I think, guys. 
I think that's going to be the contract of the future uh, with the money having to go to the players these days. So I'm curious, Dr. Lofton, I should know this, but does he have an agent? It's not Jimmy Sexton, I don't believe, is it? Uh, I don't think it's Sexton. He has an agent, certainly. Uh, no, no coach's level. I mean, this contract puts him kind of in the middle of the SEC in terms of its regular terms. I think it's almost – it is unique, I believe, in terms of its innovation. Nobody else has uh, a $3.5 million kicker uh, at the end of the day. Uh, there's some serious kickers in the, in the other contracts here, but not that one. Uh, the other thing is that it's, it's a less expensive contract than what we had before at Texas A&M. Um, and if he is dismissed without cause, uh, he walks away with a payout of around $26, $27 million. Uh, if it happens after one year and it's it changes over time, obviously, uh, it's seventy five percent really of his remaining contract terms is what he walks away with. Uh, at the beginning, it goes to eighty percent towards the end of the contract term, but it's it's actually a, a, a reasonable contract. And like the contracts I've signed dozens and dozens of times, it tells you you know uh, you you need to. Uh, you need to go after another job if we get rid of you. Uh, and that's that's missing from a contract I could name that we've had here in the past. But that's t- typically what's there. What's missing is the complete part of that. Normally, those contract clauses only say you're encouraged to go find a job. They also say if you get a job, we're going to reduce your payout by whatever the amount that job pays you. Uh, that's missing from his. Uh, but all that's missing from uh, the previous coaching contract we had here. So I think it's a reasonable contract. It, it builds in some real reasons to do well. Uh, not that any real good coach needs that, but I think it's it's a symbol of, of what value the university places on success. And I think that's re- it's reasonable. Uh, it's a reasonable contract compared to what others are out there today in terms of its buyout provisions. Uh, if he walks away on his own, it, it costs him some money too, obviously. So it's it's got some give and take. And that's what these contracts should have is give and take, not just take. Uh, and I think that's, that's reasonable. John, you said wave of the future. I think it's very similar. I don't know the numbers specifically, but I think Jeff Levy's at Mississippi State when he was hired, uh, also in the offseason. Mm-hmm. I think he has also had incentives built into his as well. And I remember the fight, let's say, I think when Brett Bielema left Arkansas, before he got back in college, he was working with the Patriots, and I think at that time they wanted to discount his NFL coaching from their buyout. So, again, I don't think you can artificially constrict a contract because an agent will never go for that. There was an NBA coach who took a job at way below cost that the other 29 head coaches were not, were not happy about. Um, but, John, I agree with you. I think it is. This is the wave of the future where I think the base will be decent. And then to incentivize after that will be the way to go. Yeah, because I, uh, I, I think in the past, everybody's been paying coaches like they've already won a national championship. In this particular scenario, you've got to earn your way to that right. And I think, again, that's a very, you know, a very fair way to look at it as we go forward. Yeah, I, I recall negotiating with a, uh, a head coach. Uh, for a contract extension and, and expansion, literally, at a school I was the chancellor of at Fall Back. And uh, I, I thought that, that Gary Pinkle was was a good coach. Well, he was worth it. Uh, unfortunately, I got into a situation where I was sitting next to my boss, the head of the system, and next to uh, Mr. Pinkle. And uh, it was a difficult conversation because I felt Pinkle wasn't asking for an exorbitant amount, but uh, my my boss was all about incentivization and not about compensation, and so it was a it was a challenging conversation. I, I finally got to pl- got to a place I thought was reasonable. Uh, Gary wasn't too happy about it, but he was okay to sign finally. But I was very disturbed by having to negotiate with my boss to sit next to me, <laughs> and then and the coach I was negotiating with sitting the other side of me and trying to bring. Two very disparate sides together, but I, I, what came out of that was very interesting, guys. It was it's very clear to me that that I think every head coach looks at him, him or herself, probably himself in football, literally, but looks at himself uh, in terms of the other coaches. 
And so where you where you sit in the pecking order is a pretty important thing. Uh, you, John, you have the most experience of any of us probably with this sort of thing. I mean, is that pretty ubiquitous? Is that what every coach looks at? They look at the value of their contract and they compare it to the value of the coaches in their, in their conference for sure, and maybe beyond their conference and, 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 and do that, that pecking order. Is that, is that really what it, what's like all the time? Uh, pretty close. I haven't seen the contracts lately, but I remember there used to be a clause. Uh, my good friend Les Miles had a deal when he was at LSU that basically said he was going to get paid one dollar more than every the highest paid SEC coach was at that time. So that gave him some protection about who they done. I think he'd come off the national championship then. You know, leverage is an important part of those negotiations too. So uh, I haven't seen that type of clause out there as much anymore. It doesn't mean they're not there. But I think back in the day, there was those types of, of, of caveats were put or provisions were put in uh, to make sure if a coach had won a national championship and again, the market went up, that he would be compensated fairly for that because technically he'd already won that at, at that level. So I think, again, that was one of the things that the coaches did to ensure them that they would always be at that upper echelon level uh, if and when they hadn't won one in a couple of years. Yeah, so, so the issue is not the actual money the coach gets. It's just how that stacks up against everyone else out there that he views as his peer. Uh, and that's, I think, an accurate assessment. It's worth, I could tell from my two linear experiences I had at AM and at and, and, and Missouri where I saw this firsthand, basically, uh, in working with coaches. Uh, I know that the uh, termination process is not a pleasant one for anybody. Uh, I've been through that uh, myself and dealt with it as best I could, but it's hard for any coach to be told we don't want you anymore. Uh, I think that the interesting thing I've seen lately is that the former Texas a and coach uh, seems to have gotten a job now. Uh, he, he's an analyst, I believe, is the current term for that, a, a talking head in other, other parlance. And so that's out there right now for, for that person anyway going forward. Uh, rumors abound about his coaching again most recently about coaching in Florida because it was said that, well, this guy recruits recruited in Florida. Therefore, he must know that. It must be of some value. After we saw the uh, the uh, Clemson-Florida game uh, the other day, that was, I mean, not Clemson-Florida, but, but uh, Florida-Miami game, rather, that was a rather interesting outcome. And I wonder if that coach is going to have uh, uh, some buyout conversations anytime soon. <laughs> I was just disappointed. I'd worked with that coach for six years. I thought I could host his show as well on Sirius XM. I had a little experience <laughs> doing that. I'm going to add one more thing into that. And this, this was some years ago when you have, you talk about coaches wanting to be, where do they rank with their contracts? What about a basketball or baseball coach that wants more money than say a football coach at a football school? That was not going to happen at a couple of schools, so they had to they had to look elsewhere. It's almost something else that comes into play when you're when you're negotiating with a contract. Well, clearly, there are situations where a non football sport can command something. I'll I'll cite one example: uh, a school called Kansas, uh, where a certain coach there has been able to be the highest paid coach for for a while. Um, just to give you a quick story I've said before on this podcast, but uh, when I tried to revive the uh, the Missouri-Kansas uh, rivalry, uh, I ran into this directly. I, I went to the powers that be in Kansas City, and I said, how about uh, having a rematch between Missouri and Kansas at Arrowhead Stadium? And the powers that be in Kansas City were really in favor of that, and they told me, uh, we'll give you net net 3.5 million each to come do that. And, you know, at that time in history, three, three and a half million a piece was a pretty good number when it's net, especially. And so I called up the, uh, the chancellor at, uh, at uh, Kansas and I said, uh, what do you think about this? She said, I like it. I like it. Uh, let me get back to you. So she called me back and her first words were, Bill won't let me. <laughs> so that gave me a real sense of who was in charge <laughs> at the University of Kansas anyway. And I'm, I'm giving you an exact quote of what she said to me on the telephone. Bill won't let me. And uh, I sort of guessed that might have been the case, but that's why that game has not yet to occur. 
I, it may still someday take place. By the way, I also negotiated a, a similar deal for basketball, men's basketball between Missouri and, and Kansas uh, in the arena there in Kansas City. Uh, and that was going to pay uh, $1.5 million to each team net, which is not bad money to walk away from uh, for a game like that. And, and again, that didn't go anywhere. So, <laughs> so one tries and, and uh, one realizes that sometimes uh, the shots are being called by the person you think shouldn't be calling the shots, but, but really is. <laughs> Is part is part of that because you can't win in a situation like that. Win the game, you don't get anything out of it. Lose it, and it's it's negative. That always seemed to be the problem with for years. Maryland and Georgetown would not play. They would go maybe it play. It could be, although I mean, from my perspective as the campus CEO, this was net. This was free and clear. The only negative I could see was the fact that the home merchants, either either in Lawrence or in in Columbia, Missouri, weren't going to get anything out of it. That was what I was getting beat up about, was the fact that any game you play at a neutral site means you aren't playing at home. Uh, right. And usually a home and home is what you're going to look for uh, to get that compensation there locally in the economy. Uh, so that was a negative I expected to get. Um, I think when you can guarantee three, and this is, again, this is many years ago, when you can guarantee $3.5 million to each team uh, after all expenses, Right. Uh, that was your net. I mean, that to me was was a good deal. And Missouri wasn't in good financial shape at that point. We just uh, left the Big 12. The uh, the the agreement as they left the Big 12 was much poorer for Missouri than for Texas A&M. And uh, and that school, in my opinion, has never really recovered totally from that. Uh, they have a much smaller stadium, their stadium seats in the 60s, uh, and they put a lot of money into it recently. But it's still a pretty small stadium. Uh, they are getting sellouts right now. I might say they've been bragging lately to me about the fact that Drinkwitz is, is such a successful coach that they're seeing sellouts now, even for non-conference games, which I think is an impressive thing. But you have to calibrate that against the size of their stadium. Uh, for some reason, you know, that's that's been a real problem for them. The sponsorships and ticket revenue are so much smaller there than most SEC schools. But but Vandy is is the is the case which I, I think should talk about. Vandy had a pretty good weekend, guys, and uh, and they have a pretty small stadium, and they don't have a large hometown sort of population following them. Uh, so that's a challenge for them. But weren't you guys impressed by by Vanderbilt pulling that off, beating Virginia Tech? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, good win for them. Yeah. And I also think that's that that's a that's a fascinating area of recruiting too. that Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia area, that 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 part of the SEC and the ACC There's a reason why you hear schools like Virginia Tech and North Carolina brought up when it comes to if the SEC were going to expand. That is a huge recruiting area. And to your point, Dr. Lofton, Vanderbilt is really Nashville. And that's it, because that's a University of Tennessee state for the most part there are pockets but that's a big one because vandy hasn't been i I think this is the worst thing in sports to be irrelevant (laughs) always be good it's not always bad to be bad because you're talked about when you're irrelevant i think that's the worst thing to be this made vanderbilt relevant under clark lee it certainly did and i think the they've been relevant in baseball and basketball from time to time, that's been where they put their assets, obviously, and I understand that. Uh, but, you know, in the SEC, football still sort of carries the weight, as we all know. And to make that game happen, you could argue that Virginia Tech wasn't the strongest opponent out there, but that was a, it was a national game. It was a national game, and they were able to walk off uh, the field with some their heads held high. And that was, I was very, very fond of that that moment there to see them win that particular game guys so so to vanderbilt john to vanderbilt winning that probably when you bring virginia tech in you bring in recruits not just for football for basketball for softball for all your sports right we just we opened this show by talking about a m and kyle field and that residue of that vanderbilt feels that throughout all their sports do they not on a, in a win like that They've got to, yeah. So it, it's huge for them, and I think again, that is a big, big recruiting weekend for all other sports. 
you know, to bring their top folks in because, you know, you have a big crowd. It's, it's Nashville, great city. So uh, for them, you know, I think, again, that's what you want to do. It makes them relevant. When's a football game? You know, people are talking about them this week. Now we'll be talking about them all season. Who knows? But part of the reason Vanderbilt won that game was the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. You know, they were able to get uh, fill some spots in there and have a quarterback that did a pretty good job that game. And, you know, and then those kinds of things happen now. So it's not going to be uncommon to see some of the proverbial have nots beat some of the proverbial haves in that particular in, in that particular realm. So to me, that's not as big as an upset in this day and age, but it's certainly from a Vanderbilt perspective, it was something that made that university feel very good. And a building block and a foundation for someone like Clark Lee, right? He gets there and I'm sure their fans are saying, okay, when's that signature moment coming? And that's his first signature moment. Yeah. Yeah, beating a good, you know, again, I don't know where Virginia Tech's going to end up in the ACC when it's all said and done, but certainly week one, that's a big win, and no one was expecting Vanderbilt to win that. You guys always talk about schools as brands, and in football, because of what Frank Beamer did for years, Virginia Tech has a brand. Yep. In fo- they used to be the underdog, right, who would go anywhere. Now they're the ones that kind of have the target on their back, even though Frank Beamer's not always there. <laughs> the The residue of his success is yep. there as well. Yeah, I'm so old, guys. I'm so old. I remember when when Rice was relevant. Uh, Back in the 50s, Rice still did some pretty darn good football teams. And uh, I blame Mr. Heike's world, really. And when TV became the dominant force in in college football, uh, Rice became irrelevant because they just could not compete against other schools the standpoint of resources for football. They just couldn't do it. Uh, the 60s saw them begin to falter, and by the by, the middle to late 60s, they were pretty well irrelevant. Uh, and again, they had a big stadium. Uh, at that time, the biggest stadium in the Southwest Conference was at Rice University. I uh, I was privileged to, uh, was it Super Bowl nine guys? Which one was it that was at Rice Stadium? Uh, so I was a grad student there at the time, and I got to sell beer. Uh, in Rice Stadium to make some money during Super Bowl. Okay, so and I got to watch a little bit of the game profit. in the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I, Rice has a tradition, guys. It's called the beer bike race. Okay, in the old old days, uh, people would drink beer and ride bikes, and drink beer and ride bikes, and that got to be sort of dangerous. <laughs> and so, by the time I got there, there was a designated drinker. And a designated biker. Guess what I was on my team? <laughs> I was not the biker, okay? <laughs> I, was, I was going to say. Yeah. I was not the biker. But, 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 but biking skills don't apply to that one. Yeah. So is that how the movie Breaking Away was? Is that what that one's really about? I, I Can you imagine so. if you did that now with Houston traffic? Oh, God. Oh, huh. Well, we did, it, we did it at Rice Stadium around the track. And so basically the deal was the, the drinker, me in that case drank a 16 ounce beer as quick as they could uh-huh. the biker took off got back when they got back he drank a second beer it took off ran around the track again and a third beer and a fourth beer to make a mile around the track that's how it was all all worked out uh the 16 ounce cans were actually had the tops removed the day before and as you put it in your hands the hole was poked in the bottom so it was a flat beer no 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 foam anymore your your hand was over a hole in the bottom. You put your whole mouth over the top of the can, turned it upside down, took your finger off the hole, and just inhaled it. Basically, that's how that's how it was done on the drinking side of the equation, which I'm familiar with. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, the the biker the biker was usually a pretty serious biker. Uh, unfortunately, we were grad students. We were too old, and the undergrad seemed to always win. At least the bike part of it. <laughs> only about that, that experience uh, only that story tops how he began that conversation that john killed rice football <laughs> <laughs> well i didn't mean john personally but i just think t- tv john you can come in the tv contracts began to change how things happen you know that that was that in the 60s was the time this all happened and ultimately the southwest conference faded away for that reason they were one state Basically, a one-day conference wasn't going to cut it in the modern TV world, and you helped create that world, John. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, we, we probably could devote another whole podcast to the, you know, the history of that. Maybe we should someday, you know, to yeah. go through that with the CFA and how everything kind of developed back in those days. But but again, a school like Rice, U of H, that stadium, I think with Neely in the early, the late 50s, early 60s, I don't know what happened to them. But where they sort of, again, the leadership at that school felt probably athletics wasn't as important as academics. And that was probably made as a conscious decision. And that's what ultimately happened. And no matter how hard they try, it's going to be hard to get them back. SMU, on the other hand, you know, they have been really going out of their way to bring their, you know, private institution, you know, to get them back up to uh, to, to the levels that they were in the 80s. And I think, you know, again, will that will that play out? Who knows yet? We've talked in this podcast. At least they have a seat at the table today. Uh, mo moving to the ACC. Yeah. If we can put a man on the moon, but we can't be competitive in football. Right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Why does Rice play Texas? <laughs> that's exactly right. So football. Well, speaking of those, speaking of those yeah. games, guys, you talked about Kansas, Missouri. I mean, if you looked at this first week of the, the football season, I think, again, if you look at the probably three of the four most watched football games were sort of those made for uh, made for TV classics. You had LSU, USC, number one watch game, obviously a great primetime window on, on Sunday. Uh, you know, we had the game at, uh, in Atlanta between Clemson and Georgia. So you talked about Missouri, uh, Missouri and Kansas. What a great way for them to play at Arrowhead to kick off a game there somewhere like that. So I think you may see more of those types of games pop up. They certainly were able to generate eyeballs. Uh, the bowl games aren't quite as valuable as they are later in the season with all the different things that are going on there. So I do think the the first part of the of this season probably bodes well for schools to look for those types of games and play those types of games. I think I heard Saban talking on game day was like, why do you want to go beat somebody 70 to nothing? You really don't find out about your team in those particular areas and versus going out and playing a really caliber, you know, high opponent matchup. In today's world of the playoffs being 12 teams, you can lose that game. It's still not going to hurt you that bad at the end of the day. So, again, I would not be surprised to see more of those types of things, you know, take off just because I think there's, again, more revenue in those types of things, offsetting trying to play a home game for some of these schools. But look at Georgia does it. You know, these big schools do it. So the opportunities for revenue are certainly there. Recruiting is good for them. And, and being on those national television spotlights can't hurt either. With no NFL this first week, right? Not, and I'm not even including week zero, yeah. but that first week, it's really a college football weekend. So it is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday for college football, filling that football void, if you will. Yeah, I, so, I'd like to see really just getting away from, especially for the opening weekend when you have no NFL competition, to get away from the idea of playing a team you beat 75 to nothing. That just, I mean, why do I want to watch that? I mean, after the first you know, quarter, I'm done, <laughs> basically. Uh, luckily, we had a few real games on that weekend that were really important. The commissioners would love, the commissioners would love to see there be a stack up of Big Ten, SEC, SEC, Big 12, uh, ACC, Big Ten games uh, around the country here. But coaches just fight, fight that for obvious reasons. They don't want to be challenging their six game win requirement uh, in terms of getting to a bowl. But I think bowl games to me are much less important than big, getting butts in the seat at your own stadium. And you do that by having a relevant game there. And I think it was a very relevant game in college station, a very relevant game uh, at Georgia, for example. So we had some relevant games, but we had some very irrelevant games as well. And I'm just hoping we get away from that, especially when you go to one more conference game, which right. the Big Ten has done now, uh, you know, that's you have that. Give them a couple of these big win games if they have to, but then make sure the other game is going to be a true uh, non-conference game, which has meat to it, some real intense meat to it in terms of the competition that's there. And you will get the TV audience. You'll get the butts in the seat at the stadium for that. Uh, I, I'm guessing McNeese won't be quite as full Right. 107 plus thousand we saw at Kyle Field this past Saturday when Notre Dame was there. Guys, you think about that? Yeah, you're exactly right. John, I like the point you made. I think a 12 team playoff makes this a little more viable. Yeah. I think in four, if you if you look at four, right? You probably don't want to do unless it. LSU runs the table, they're out. Yeah. In week I one, an, right? I saw some stats the other day that Florida State, if they win the ACC, can still uh, yeah. you know, you know, be in the tournament after going 0 and 2. So Remember when you were the Cowboys didn't have Emmett Smith up the season 0-2 and then they ended up winning the Super Bowl. So 
you know, again, just getting in the tournament is what the, what it's all about. And again, at 12 teams, you know, and again, I think you learn more about your team playing. I mean, I think LSU learned more about their team than if they'd have played McNeese State this past weekend. So those are things I think as a coach, you would probably take back and use that as a learning tool or a coaching tool. It's going to get you better versus, again, beating somebody up, you know, 70 to nothing. I don't know what you learned there. We started by talking about the contract, Dr. Lofton. So I know that a, a coach would want that for the six wins and a bowl. But another very simple way to do this is to give teams those 15 practices after the season, whether you make the bowl or not. Yeah. I know how valuable that is for coaches. Maybe you just waive that, that you don't have to make a bowl. You still get those 15 to use as you please. Well, then the dead period. The and then contract gonna... is silent on bowl games. Think about it. It's and silent. and Ross Bjork you know, said at the time he's supposed to make a ball. <laughs> That's what Ross said at the time. He's supposed to make a ball. There's no incentive for that. Yeah. yeah. Fair, unfair. But that's a great point, Dr. Lofton. When you when you read off those, th th that was not in there. Right, exactly. And I think that's that to me is where we're headed down the road here. There's no reason these bowl games, other than the ones that are in the playoffs themselves, these bowl games are simply not relevant like they used to be. Uh, they were at a time, I'll be the first to say it, Correct. they were wonderful. But, I mean, now we've moved on to the playoffs. And that's with 12 teams now, that is a very, very central focus for every football fan out there, every football player out there, every coach out there is to get those, those playoffs. Bowl games, to me, fade away at this point in time. And I'm, I don't mean in the disrespect to the bowls. They've done no. a great job. They've incentivized people. Uh, they treat people very well. I've enjoyed being in bowl games as one of the teams. Uh, and they treat you very, very, very well. I've got an entire shelf of watches, guys, an entire yeah. shelf of watches, okay? But, but, uh, <laughs> but to your point, I think those bowls now, to yours and John's points, I think those bowls now can be that first weekend. The reason why we love bowls is we saw matchups we would never see. Now, if you expand that, when's LSU playing USC? We yeah. talk about this past weekend, the last time A&M and Notre Dame played, and you're talking about the old great cotton ball games that they played. So maybe the, that shift of intriguing matchups aren't coming in December any longer, but in September, and to John's point, the numbers bear that out. The television numbers bear that out. Yeah. And, and Dr. Lofton, even though those bowl games may not be as relevant as they once were, they're still great content for networks like ESPN because they can schedule a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. you know, during the month of December. Usually a great promotional vehicle driving all that audience toward their CFP playoff coverage. Right. And for those and for those communities as well, John. Yeah. And there's still teams that want to be there. I mean, if you're Middle Tennessee State and you get there, or you're Sam Houston or some of these guys get invited to that, that's great for them. I think, again, it's, it hope springs eternal. But for your big boys, I mean, it's, it's CFP or bus for the most part. Football eventually is going to get to 105 spots. I didn't say scholarships. It's going to be spots, right? We get that. So, Dr. Lofton, our next point, what happens if the House versus NCAA settlement – what happens with the roster limits and the scholarships if this is all approved by the judge? Well, you know, hundred. I think most coaches would agree that 105 is enough. Uh, 120 rosters are going to go go away if this is this is agreed to by the judge, and I'm pretty sure it will be. Uh, clearly, what happened here is that the NCAA saw that if they were to impose scholarship limits themselves that'd be one more litigable kind of thing here one more thing to lose in the courts they've lost everything so far and so they were keen on negotiating uh with the house plaintiffs that let's have roster limits scholarships for everybody basically what i want to ask you guys about you're keen observers of the sport of the atmosphere of the culture walk-ons in some schools, walk-ons have been very, very, very important. I can think about the Jackie Sherrill era at Texas A&M, what walk-ons meant there in terms of the 12th man kickoff team. But I'm asking you guys to just talk a bit about how you think walk-ons will be uh, either there or not there in this new era if these limits are approved the way I think they will be. 
Well, my first thought is that, again, let's look at the NFL model. And as we d- discuss it, they have what they call a practice squad. So if your walk-ons become sort of like that's what they're delegated as, I think walk-ons are important and they should be part of this tradition. And there needs to be a way to find to create that opportunity for these types of student athletes to still get a shot at, or students at that point who still get a shot at, uh, you know, th- th- these these dreams that they have. So I think, you know, cooler heads will prevail and they'll figure out a way to have walk-ons that may not be considered part of the 105, you know, again, it doesn't seem like it should be that difficult to figure that out, but using the NFL model, create some type of practice squad relationship. And if you're one of these guys who's got a bunch of NIL money, I read it. I can't remember the name of the school I just saw, but one of the kids gave all his money to the walk-ons or at least a big portion of his money to the walk-ons. So if you're making $800,000 a year as a college quarterback and you want to give, you know, 120,000 of that to these kids as walk-ons or whatever it is, 50,000, I mean, those types of things are going to happen. I think it's going to create great camaraderie and on, on, on an organization like that and build a tremendous culture. So, again, I think walk-ons will always be, be in that process. And I think it's up to the people who are figuring out the rules to figure out what that looks like. So that doesn't negatively impact and would be something that would be litigated as all these things usually tend out to be. So, again, if I'm the, if I'm the SEC or the Big Ten and I say we should have walk-ons, my guess is we'll have walk-ons and you know, whatever that fashion or form looks like. Charlie Condon, Georgia player, walk-on, second pick in the MLB draft. If there are no walk-ons, there are no Charlie Condon stories. Yeah, exactly. And and that's why I said 105 spots. I didn't say 105 scholarships because walk-ons will take on those spots, and that will be the same thing for 34 spots in baseball. It might be 24 scholarships. But I'm with you. I think the the walk-on – now, some schools don't value walk-ons. But then again, there were some schools they loved not just red shirts, but gray shirts, and they just took everybody. To to Dr. Lofton, your point, when you said 120, that was the fair number for a lot of schools because, yeah, they weren't on scholarship, but you could keep them uh, on, on your team. So, I, 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 again, in, in Texas A&M, let's, yeah. let's talk current 12th man, Nana Boedi Wusu, right? Arlington Martin High School doesn't play football till late. Miles Garrett comes back to school. Nana says, can I work out with you? He said it very timidly. He wasn't sure. Miles said yes. That was the impetus to have Nana play football. Nana asks his high school coach, can you call Texas A&M in a walk-on? His coach called Terry Price, and Terry said, I will make it happen. That's the reality of a, of a walk-on, and there's a lot of those realities um, there's an entire restaurant chain called walk-ons because <laughs> he was a former walk-on and now he owns the restaurant and restaurants actually, uh, plural, uh, not just here in college station, but I think they have the Waco and Conroe as well. I, I think there's, I think there's definitely a place and not just in football. I think in all sports, in all sports too. I do agree with you like that. And plus these are great stories that college football needs to tell from time to time versus Agreed. all the other ones that we tend to hear about. I mean, there would be no Rudy if this wasn't the case. And we're still talking about him 40 years after the fact. So there is, I think there'll always be a place for walk-ons in all sports. And I think, again, there should be a way that, you know, the the, the powers that be can figure that out where it's not going to be in a situation that's going to be litigated all the time. Well, I, I think there'll be a quiet shift, though. Look at the power of four. They'll do it one way. Uh, the group of five, a different way. And those schools down in, in D2 and D3, Yet another way. One of the problems I see is the private versus public situation. Uh, public schools uh, have lower tuition for in-state <laughs> people. Can you see a situation where you would take your scholarship money and maybe use that to take care of out-of-state kids who are paying, if they're walk-on types, paying full freight? which is usually three times or more what the in-state tuition rate is, mm. uh, and then pay the in-state kid who's getting a real break on tuition enough money to cover books or whatever, et cetera, type of thing here. That's one possible way this might play out for some schools uh, that don't have the money. If you're, a, if you're a small private with a fairly modest budget, every single tuition-paying student is extremely important to you. And giving a scholarship out which waives that tuition is a very tough economic decision for that school. Uh, And so how do you balance that? I can see different schools at different levels 
playing this game pretty differently just because they have to. Uh, Power Four have a lot of assets, a lot of things out there going for them. They'll be paying their players. Uh, the NL, NIL money is there, too, since they have a lot of wealthy alumni. Uh, and they may do it a, in a very different way than even a group of five might do it, who's really trying to figure out how to make this happen uh, with what they've got to compete against for recruiting purposes. So I think there's going to be a very interesting sort of cultural divide here, maybe two to three ways, depending on where you sit in the economic hierarchy of these of these kinds of, of football programs. Uh, the 105 is a number which is adequate. I think no coach will tell you they can't field a good team with 105 players. They, they can do it with 80 for that matter, but they now are 85. They can do 100 with 105, no problem. It's going to be how you mix that up. How do you really deal with that? And I just think that some schools like Texas A&M have had a long history of valuing walk-ons. And I, I'm looking forward to John. I think John's right. Something will work out here. Something will fall out of the tree here that gives – uh, us a capability of maintaining that at the schools that want it. But I think the, the real story may be a group of five. And even some of these uh, D3 and D, D, uh, D2 schools that are trying to just make it work. And not many, but occasionally we see uh, players emerging, uh, even from down in D3, that make it in, in the pros. It didn't happen very often, but it happens, guys. So you have those those jewels hidden down there. And nobody saw him but some local coach. Or maybe there was some private personal reason they decided to go to a particular school. And I hate to say it go away. That gives you that wild card you've always enjoyed watching, right? Uh, we enjoy seeing those wild cards out there. Having a kid uh, come from nothing and make it big is uh, still an American story to all of us. And we don't want that to be impossible anymore. So I think it's going to be a challenge out there. Uh, I just don't know how it's going to work out. I think the other sports have their challenges, too. I think Title IX is still to be understood. I mean, what's that really mean? Uh, will scholarship values be equivalent uh, between male and female sports completely? That's going to be an interesting question. And uh, if it's not equal, I know litigation will occur. If it occurs, will there be rational behavior on the part of the judges and juries that might make those decisions. I can't predict that right now. But there's a lot of, of miles to go yet before we see uh, any kind of stability in the college sports world. Football is a male sport so far. That's going to be what it's going to be. I got all that. Uh, baseball is there. Softball has a somewhat lower limit uh, in terms of its roster size than, than baseball does. Uh, but look at you got 50. 50 girls are going to be there for equestrian. That's that's the limit there, guys. 50. That's a hefty number, okay, for a, for a, a non-revenue sport to deal with here. And I might say that horses eat a lot. I know. <laughs> I pay for one. So uh, so that that's one of those things that you got to deal with in terms of how you expense that out. And what schools survive? The SEC is down to four teams that feel equestrian. Four. And that is the absolute minimum number uh, by conference standards you can have to have a conference championship. And uh, I think every year is going to be the year we see it drop down to three and maybe that sport go away. Uh, the NCAA itself would like to see the equestrian go away because it's not one of those sports that's growing. It's one of those sports that's shrinking right now. It's going to be team by team, right? Especially in group of five. And it may determine where a student athlete goes if that one school i mean when we say limit doesn't mean that every school is going to give out 105 when we say limit in baseball you know 34 spots probably 24 scholarships doesn't mean every school is going to give out 24 it may determine where student athletes go and it may be a reason why some programs accelerate and again this is going to come from the money that gets generated right from boosters and alums that may also determine why a certain school will be a breakout school and why some schools that have been good, if they don't have the money nor the resources, student athletes aren't going to go there. It could go both ways, I would think. I agree. Yeah, I think we've talked about this too. And I think, again, what you're seeing, again, is the way the rules are being structured. It's being there's the separation continues to go between the haves and the have-nots and the haves, basically the SEC and the Big Ten 
will probably at some point set up their own set of rules for their schools, just like uh, Baker said back in November, some schools are going to compete at different levels. And it's going to there will be a natural evolution through this process that will allow all schools don't have to play by the same rules. And the schools at that upper level will create rules that will best fit them in this process. Because one of the biggest problems the NCAA had forever and ever and ever was trying to kick a D3 school happy with a school like Ohio State. Wasn't that good? That gap is just too wide. And all they did was create problems that brought all these lawsuits on. So no one else is to blame but them for the last 25, 30, 40 years of how they handled this. So now there's a chance to write the system and build yourself a model that's going to work, that's going to be sustainable, and hopefully is going to be, you know, have minimal opportunities to be litigated against because the members have put the rules together. John, final topic for our show, TV contracts, the new ones and the changed ones. How are they affected in this college space, given what has happened recently in the uh, professional sports space? Do you see any changes or anything upcoming for TV contracts in college? Well, I think most of your TV deals for the for the big schools are done right now. I mean, the SEC deal is done through the 2030s. Uh, big 10 is done through the 2030s. Big 12s, I think they're, they'll be the first one up now in their new deal. So I think you're going to see a little bit of a uh, calm in the waters, as you will, as far as TV contracts go for now. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no. So I think you'll see some some calmness in the waters now as for, for a little while. But I think there's always going to be an underlying current of where these things happen. What's what's going to be the next step out there? Um, I've been following very closely what's going on with my our old friends at Diamond Sports. And I don't know if you read this last week, ESPN now has come out and raised their hands and said, let us help these local situations. We can be we can be a partner and a solution to these problems because the cable bundles continue to erode, which is we've all talked about. That's no secret, but it's still going to be here. But how do you start to develop that switch from you know, going from a linear process or linear cable bundle to a more of a streaming world? And it's it's not going to happen overnight. But I do think the things that ESPN has done with the ESPN Plus talking about moving all of their content, which they're going to call flagship in 2025, that you can buy the entire ESPN portfolio outside of the cable bundle is going to be available in 2025. You've seen these, these conversations called Venue, which now is a bit of under some litigation right now, where Fox, who's never been in the streaming world, has partnered with ESPN and Warner Brothers to create a skinny sports bundle, if you will, you know, somewhere in the $50 range for all of that content and other programming on those networks. So that model is going through a diametric change right now. And I think, again, I think people like ESPN who are spending time thinking about it and how do they help, I think this is going to be an interesting play. And does that ultimately create more opportunities at the collegiate level? I do think there's opportunities at the college level that probably haven't been fully exploited in video content that things people like Tex-Ags do, all right? You know, again, there, there's a lot of content that they do to follow their program. You know, schools have that ability, Andrew, as we know, to kind of be their own RSN. You've got 16 sports. You don't need the events. You can talk about everything that goes around there. You don't need to do it 24-7. You can do it 15 minutes a day. So I do think some of that with the streaming world is, again, I think is going to create opportunities. Some schools have started at it. I think there, some schools are hitting the, you know, hit, hit the darts, hitting the, the, uh, the dartboard, but it's not hitting the bullseye. So I mm. think there are going to be opportunities for schools to look in some of those particular areas that are going to create more opportunities for their fans to engage with their content at a much deeper level. And that's what streaming is all about. It's the personalization, the customization, the data that you'll get from those fans who really want to watch more of the things that they're most interested about. So I do think you're going to see some more opportunities in that probably over the next years. Not so much at the national level. Those contracts are kind of pretty well set in stone. But I think you're going to see some creativity at the local and probably even conference level, too, as they look to exploit some of those rights that are still out there that their fans would eventually want to invest in and pay for. I want to ask you this. Uh, Grec TV is in this negotiation right now with with uh, Disney and it's 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 minions. Uh, they've lost everything from him, right, for the moment anyway. I'm sure it'll be fixed eventually. But I heard that one of the things they were arguing over was the interest that that plus uh, that, uh, that, uh, that that direct TV had rather was to go out and be able to provide skinny packages, be able to give people more customizable streaming packages here, and that Disney was balking at that. Uh, do you see this as a turning point anywhere or just one more? gamesmanship opportunity for the big guy. 
Well, I think what you're seeing here again, these all the, all these situations seems to happen. They never get these done, the, these deals done, you know, in, in the back room, and it's quiet, and you just move on. You're always having these issues. So, a couple of big things about Directv. One of the things that they're trying to do is they're still the, probably the second, third largest distributor out there in the linear bundle, over 10, 11, 12 million homes they've got across the country. So what they're trying to do is make sure that they don't have to pay for a lot of content that their, their viewers don't want. If you're ESPN and Disney, you know, you certainly ESPN's valuable. They'll want to pay that, but there's free form. There's all these other networks that Disney pushes down on them that they don't necessarily want to care and pay for. And so Charter was able to successfully cut a lot of fat, if you will, from their last time they did the Disney organization. They negotiated with Disney. But Charter also has a broadband business, all right? So they could say, look, we're going to exit the video business and we'll focus on broadband. And that's where we'll carry ESPN Plus, your flagship, all your other things somewhere down the road in that environment. DirecTV doesn't have that option. They're really strictly video. And so they are probably not going to have as strong as a leverage point in this area as possible. But I think they'd still like to be able to create push back, cut back some of the ESPN or the Disney content that they have to carry. But at the same point, but it's also as those fees continue to go up, a lot of these marquee events are being seen in other areas too. They're put on the streaming services. So the value of that exclusivity continues to be eroded as well through these discussions. Because you could have watched, even if you didn't have direct TV, you could have watched, if you lived in LA, you could have watched the USC um, um, LSU game on 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 Hulu or or, or is ESPN streaming? You didn't need the network to do that. So Directv is saying, why am I paying you at a you know at this rate, this marquee rate, when your content can all be you know be the majority of your content can be seen somewhere else on some of these other entities? So that's been a big price value challenge that these companies continue to have. Now again, what you'll probably see happen is that you know the NFL football game is going to be Monday night. That's the first big game that they're going to probably lose from that perspective. So you remember the charter deal gone done it was done right before the monday night game when they had aaron Rodgers with the jets i would not i would be surprised if this deal isn't done by the end of the week but i think it's another opportunity for direct tv to say for this next week to say look how we're being treated unfair we would like to carry some of these skinny bundles espn's not letting us there was litigation that we talked to about fubu they 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 filed suit against venue which is the conglomerate of the espn fox and warner brothers to say we need to be able to offer the same type of package and the judge agreed with them so so that's interesting now so this whole bundling concepts up in the air based on how the judge agreed to uh, to address this re recent issue so i think and direct tv was one of the first people who came out and said we support the judge's decision on this because it gave them more ammunition for their argument to say we would also like to do what they're doing create these skinny bundles because again one of the things about DirecTV is you still have to pay a hundred and something dollars for 700 channels. They've got a couple of different things in there, but ideally if they could say, Hey, I'm only going to, I'm a sports fan and all I want to pay is 50 bucks. They'd like to be able to make that offer to their sports fans as well. So I think again, it's all part about how the, uh, the distribution channels are changing primarily how consumers are consuming. And again, how do they build the right package for those different peoples and a sort of a more antiquated legacy package of direct TVs and the charters, et cetera, versus the new world, which are the Hulus the, and the streaming world. So it's going to be an interesting thing. And these are just continuing battles and skirmishes that we're going to see as time goes on as they still try to figure out how is the best way to reach these consumers and give these the consumers the packaging and hopefully pricing that they want to consume the content that's most valuable to them. And the strongest will survive, right, John? And the strongest will survive. Yeah, so that's why each company is going to either get, like you say, off, as many offers as as we get away from the um, old cable, everything on, do you have everything? Can we go skinnier? And that's a way to keep, instead of paying 120 a month, maybe yeah. we can still keep that customer. Yep. We're still getting 50 from that customer instead. Yeah, it, it's going he's to be He's happier because there's 700 channels he doesn't watch that he's probably no longer paying for Great point. Great point. Be fascinating. We'll see how that all plays out. Yeah. Great episode, guys. Fantastic. Good to see y'all. Yes, sir. Same Andrew, here, sir. You, are, you are the face and the voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Face for radio. Go ahead. Go with it. I didn't Go with say it. that. Sir. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. And the I camera's shouldn't. on you right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Dr. Lofton, John Heike, thank you so much. I'm Andrew Monaco. Reminder, college sports FTM at gmail.com. If you have questions for us, we'll see you again in our next episode. Nick Savage, thank you very much as well for all of us. So long.